everybody, I'm Ben Pakulski, and my guest today is Mr. Gary Roberts. If you have ever been a fan of professional hockey, certainly in the last 30 years, you will probably be familiar with Gary Roberts, someone who was a professional hockey player for 20 plus years, playing at the highest level in the world, having won a Stanley Cup, getting injured, retiring, and then coming back to play again, not only at a high level, but at maybe the highest level he had ever played in his entire life. Gary has since transitioned to coaching incredible young athletes, such as the likes of Connor McDavid, currently by far, in a way, the greatest hockey player in the world right now, just an incredible athlete. And Gary has some incredible insights on how he harnesses Connor McDavid's incredible physical prowess and capabilities. We get into some of his methodologies that allow him to succeed, not only as a player, certainly through injuries, and now well into his 50s, how he approaches his specific regime now, and ultimately how he approaches training and recovery with his athletes. Gary's got some incredible value, incredible valuable insights in this podcast, and I feel just incredibly blessed to have been welcomed into his home, met his family, and ultimately be able to see where he gets after it every day in his little gym. If you have the opportunity to watch us on YouTube, we actually are filming this live in Gary's home, in his gym, and it's just an incredible facility. So I highly suggest you check us out there. If you are someone who is not a regular listener of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, welcome to the show. We have just incredible guests and incredible value coming at you for the last 600 episodes and into the future. Already subscribe. Go ahead and do that now on Spotify, YouTube, and everywhere else amazing podcasts or listen to. I know that there's a lot going on out there. There's a lot of places for you to choose from, and we do our best to source the best information in the world and the best experts Mr. Gary Roberts certainly is at the top of that list. Ladies and gents, thanks for being here. My name is Ben Pekulski. This podcast is the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, serving you to be your highest and best, not only today, but for the rest of your life. Enjoy the show, Mr. Gary Roberts. Let's take a brief minute to thank our sponsors from today's podcast, Buy Optimizers. Buy Optimizers is known for making the highest quality, expert formulated and third-party tested, purity guaranteed products in the market. By Optimizer supplements are my top pick for optimizing digestion, optimizing sleep specifically. Now, why these things are so useful to me? While you might think that making nutritious food choices like I do every day is enough. Unfortunately, it seems as though it's not, especially for people who are training really, really hard. Even if you're not trained hard, if you're stressed, if your food supply is it absolutely immaculate, you're going to want to support digestion. You're going to want to support your nervous system. And the two ways I do that consistently, time and time again, through my Bioptimizers products are with mass zymes and P3OM. I use that combination together to optimize my gut health and digestion. And then at bedtime, I'm using their sleep formula and I'm also using their magnesium breakthrough. Just incredible products that are consistently in my medicine cabinet. But ultimately, even when I'm traveling, I don't go without Thanks to Bioptimizers, you can head over to Bioptimizers.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com. Use the code MUSCLE10 to get hooked up at checkout. Back to the show. From the home of Mr. Gary Roberts, my friend. How did I do? I appreciate you making the time. I'm, I'm a longtime fan. I've followed your career for a long time, and uh, I'm really excited to dig in because you've got, you've got an amazing story. That's a law one, so I don't know how much time we got. We got all the time in the world. Everybody's been listening. So I actually want to start like before you even got into the NHL, because I think yeah. that's an interesting place for a lot of aspiring hockey players. Like, what did that look like, you know, when you finally got that bug? And I'm sure it was very young, but when you finally got that bug to say, you know, I, this is what I want to do. Because I know, so the reason I want to understand this question is most professional athletes have a very specific mental framing towards something. It's like some somewhere between... Uh, play and obsession and uh, you know this is all I knew and I'm curious how that kind of fits for you. Yeah, I mean uh, you know growing up in a town called Whitby, Ontario, and just uh, east very close. Yep, played my minor hockey there. I truly didn't uh, think of being an NHL player. I just thought maybe it was just too far of, of a grasp for me to get to. And at when really I was 16 years old, I I got a call from a uh, from a hockey agent um, who's still my agent today, hmm. Rick Kern. And uh, he talked to my dad and said, hey, I think, you know, Gary might be drafted uh, into junior hockey. My dad says, hey, like, you should go to the draft. And I'm like, dad, I'm not, I'm not getting drafted into junior hockey, you know, kind of thing. 
and uh, ended up going to the draft and then was selected in the second round by the Auto 67s. Mm. So I would say at that time was when it really was like, wow, like, you know, I'm, I was playing in Whitby. I wasn't playing in Toronto. I wasn't playing in the big league. I was playing in the OMHA, double A hockey at the time. So I got just to think of the time that it was just, you know, it's six teams in the National Hockey League. It just wasn't something I thought about as a kid, uh, whether I'd end up making the National Hockey League. Uh, it wasn't until I really got drafted to junior hockey and started having some success as a 17-year-old that I thought there may be a chance that I that I could play. So uh, maybe not the story that you know other people have, but yeah. for me it was just I came from a household where my mom and dad worked really hard. Um, my mom worked at the hospital. My dad was an iron worker. My dad, you know, I still remember uh, check to check. He'd cash his check on Friday. He had four kids. You know, by Tuesday his wallet was empty. And spent all his money on us with sticks and skates. And yeah. and uh, that's what I remember as a child. I, I just remember how hard my dad worked to take care of his family. And I uh, was just grateful that he uh, he took the time with us to to introduce us to the game and uh, and really get us you know on course for what ended up happening for me. So what was it like from a personal level, and you know, maybe at the level of the family, to get drafted in the NHL? Yeah, like, I mean, I was uh, obviously very grateful for my parents. Personally, for me, uh, I can remember being 18 and drafted in the first round to the Calgary Flames. I mean, it was a, it was really a dream come true, but I'd say it was uh, a point where I thought, holy crap, I have an opportunity to play to play the National Hockey League. And, you know, I remember it was 1984 when I was drafted to Calgary, so it's a very long time ago. But it wasn't, it didn't come without challenges. Like, you know, I mean, to talk about, you know, why we're sitting here today, why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Uh, a lot of it probably stems from my first NHL training camp. Like I was a, I was a lacrosse player and I was a runner. I was never a weightlifter. Hmm. And um, I got drafted to probably the fittest team in the National Hockey League at that time. Calgary Flames were built with college players that were older. Uh, Badger Bob Johnson was our coach. There uh, wasn't a lot of junior A hockey players there, so a lot of the players that were there, they were in their early 20s and spent a few years of college where they lifted a lot more weights than us junior A players. Mm-hmm. So I really uh, went to my first NHL training camp not prepared. And, uh, and uh, you know, I can remember being in a room with the, at the time I think they might have had 60, 70 guys at training camp back then. Like the training camps were huge. And uh, Badger Bob Johnson got up and spoke and said, uh you know, our, our worst condition player at camp was our first round draft pick. And that's how I out. called me out in front of everybody. So I would say if anybody could have beamed me up and sent me back to junior hockey at that time, uh, that would have been the moment. I was very embarrassed. So I was asthmatic as a child. I uh, wasn't ready for the thin air in Calgary. Like all these factors led sure. to this, right? Uh, the only thing I could do was run, and I could run. Uh, had an asthma attack in the two-mile run and failed all the all the strength tests. Wow. So, you know, I left uh, my first NHL training camp at 18 and I basically said, okay, like awful experience. I'm either going to start working out and work harder off the ice or I'm, I'm not going to go bad. And it was a mission for me the next year. And uh, I owe a lot to Lauren Goldenberg for that. Like he was our strength coach in Ottawa where I played junior hockey. Ended up spending that whole next summer with him in the story. I mean, all the guys that, that I play with know the story. Uh, I went from doing one and a half chin ups in my first NHL training camp to 16 the next year. And I mean, like, they were good chin ups. Badger Bob walked to the pull up mark and watched me do the chin ups. And uh, so I had gone from one and a half to 16 in one season. So that was really the moment for me where, you know, strength, I was introduced to strength and conditioning by Lauren Goldenberg. I took the information, applied it, and it saved my career. So, you know, well, I'm here today talking to you about. Uh, you know, life in the NHL, but also uh, my journey and uh, strength and conditioning is a pretty big part of it. Sounds like a massive part of it. And would you say that was like a moment where from one year to the next, your confidence just clicked and like, I can do this. And like, yeah, you know, my first initial training camp, I can, I'm lined up beside Landy McDonald and uh, gosh, I remember uh, being in such awe of him, like he was a Toronto Maple Leaf, uh, Joe Nundek and I, who were, he ended up being his teammate when he used to a couple of them, we would go watch what they called Showdown in Toronto. Landon McDonald was part of that showdown yeah. when we were kids. So to be lined up beside him in training camp and puck dropped, he took the puck with by and he scored a goal. And that day was over and Jared Blair, the head scout, so remember who drafted me, 
uh, saw me after the game and he's after practice and he said, Hey Gary, he said, uh, just want you to know it's my job too. Like I drafted you, hmm. uh, you gotta, you know, you gotta take that guy's job. Like I said, Lanny McDonald, <laughs> gotta take his job. He's like, yeah, and you want to play Nash Hockey, you got you to gotta come and take someone's job. And that's what it started to click for me, like, holy shit, like, I'm in my car. This is what I'm competing. This isn't just my hockey. Yeah. I'm competing for my, my you know, my, my livelihood. Yeah. And this is going to be my job. And that's when, you know, I mean, all these moments in early in my career that kind of set me up for who I am today, um, there are moments like that that really stand out in my mind as being a, like a, a wake-up call, like, holy shit, like, the head scout grabbed at me. So his job's on the line, and he basically just told me, if I'm not prepared to battle Eddie McDonald for the pop, I'm not playing in the National Hockey League. Yeah. And that's when, you know, they so those, those all those moments along my journey that uh, that stand out. But that first training camp for me was was not a great experience. Was a, was a, so you're known now for being the guy who comes in and develops these young draft picks um, and, and, you know, player development from the NHL. And so I'm curious first how different you would say your experience then was as compared to what these guys are experiencing now. And if you can draw some kind of correlations and, and contradictions into what the league might look like for someone coming in at 18, 19 years old, like you did. Yeah. Like, and I still, I mean, believe it or not, there's still a lot of moments in, in player development when certain players are only exposed to so much as young players. Yep. And a lot of players are still come in. You're like, ah, she's, it's not where we thought he was. Uh, there's all, I mean, no one has it figured out. Between 14 and 18, kids today play hockey. Strength and conditioning is still part of it, but it's still mm -hmm. not the basis. Our biggest challenge as a company is trying to convince our players that they need to stay off the ice. They don't have to touch the ice every day to be great. So although you might think the information, no doubt, the information's amazing if you're prepared to listen, there's a lot of great information, a lot of great people out there that can give you some direction, but it's really tough to program a hockey team. Uh, you play hockey nine months a year, and you've got to be really with an organization that is committed to helping these players for life and not just the moment. And the moment of just winning games, there's a certain mentality for most organizations, and the workouts and the strength training and the nutrition side of it is still an afterthought. So we get kids at 18 years old, and I think that's where the NHL teams uh, are successful developing or building their team through the draft. They invest in player development. Right. And getting more touch points with these young players at 18, when they're drafted, you still don't get them under your roof till they're 20 years old. So they're not pro hockey players till they're 20. They're still playing junior hockey. They're still trying to go to school. They're still on buses. They're still crazy busy. They, a lot of them act like they're in the NHL, but they're not. It just takes a it takes a real you know commitment by organizations to keep kids at that age on task and on task of reaching the ultimate goal of being in the National Hockey League. But it's a it's a big journey between the day you're drafted and the day you play in the National Hockey League. I mean, you have your handful of guys that may play as eighteen year olds every year, right? But other than that, it's 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 two years, right? In most cases, it sounds like when you were coming in. Only the strong survive. Like you're gonna get you're gonna get broken down, and if you're strong enough to make it through, maybe you're, you'll be you know good enough and strong enough to make it through. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to play. Whereas now, there's a little more intention by it. There's a little more support. Agreed, hundred um, percent. You know, I think about my 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 job currently with Seattle and the time they spent on player development, and the people that um, mm -hmm. uh, to that are involved in that, whether it's an extra video guy, an extra skill development guy, power skating guy. Uh, you know, Jeff Temple, he does an amazing job for our young prospects, staying in touch with them, traveling to see them. Like there's a there's a handful of guys that were or more that are in charge of player development, right? Uh, that that is that wasn't the case back then. And I would agree hundred percent. The strong survive when we were younger and uh, the mentality that when things aren't going well, just work harder. Yeah. That, you know, that was okay. It worked. Yeah. But now it, there's a lot more science to it today. To try that, to try to get players to get to where they need to go, but a little safer and a little, a little more hope for for more players to have longevity in the game. Right. You had an incredible career, and I'm curious how you would say that a team now would create a culture of winning. Because I think these young guys coming in, you're going into all these different organizations, and some of them just perpetually win, and some of them perpetually don't win. And I'm curious 
you know, if you are in charge of the team, which you are in this case in, in player development, like what are you doing to create a culture of winning or a culture of success in the organization? Yeah, like with within the organization, I think it's 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 trust. It's it's having uh, you know having the confidence as a manager to bring a group of people in that you really believe are are good at what they do, and and not micromanaging those people, letting them letting them do their jobs. But it definitely is. It takes it takes an army. It takes an army to. Uh, create that culture where, you know, years ago, veteran players had a bigger impact. Even if you weren't a, a high minute guy, you had an impact on the culture of the destiny room. Yep. And I think with how young the game is today, it's tougher for those younger players to, they don't say they don't respect them, but they don't appreciate what other players did. It's like, God, why is he so gliding? Like, you know, can we, can we get rid of that guy? Mm. You know what I mean? Like the younger players, that they can just tougher. If you're going to be a veteran guy today, and I still think there's a need for veteran players that work hard, that are good people, I just believe those players need to have a bigger impact on the game to get the respect from the younger players because of the, the immaturity in that area in, in, in our youth. I mean, you see the league today. It's a very old. It's a young, it's a young yeah. men's game. So do you think that's because of the way the game's changed? Whereas when you were playing, it was very gritty, very, I'll say it's very masculine, whereas now it's a little bit more uh, skilled yeah. and, um, no, so like fast and skillful, whereas when you're playing, it was like gritty and you need to be be willing to take a punch in the mouth. Agreed. You know, that's, it's, it's, it is more skilled and believe me, I love, I love watching the skill. I do. Do I still like seeing a little animosity in the game? Yes. Yes. Do I want to see, do I want to see players talking at face-offs? Yeah. No. No? No. Like, Not like talk, like, talking to, like, to the opposition. Got it. You know, I could be sitting beside my best friend, Joan Yundai, on right. face off, but we're not talking to each other. Right. Like, those are the... Oh, like friendly talking. Friendly talking. I thought you were talking trash talking. No, I'm not <laughs> trash talking. I, I, I'm, uh, that's, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not talking trash talking, but I mean, hey, like, actually having a conversation. Right. I just find that part for me, like, I am, I'm obviously, you know, I call my old boy, new boy kind of thing. I'm still in it. I'm still in it. I appreciate the game. I would not hear it today to, to put down the game because I love watching the skill of the players. But I do believe that uh, there's a lot of games that it, it just doesn't look like anybody's really angry with each other. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I and I, me being the kind of player I was, and and uh, you know how I grew up playing the game, and how coaches that coached me, like you weren't allowed to talk to the opposition. Like, there were some coaches I played for that if you cross paths with the opposition in the hallway, you better not smile at them. You better not talk to them. All right. So yeah. it's that that mentality that I that I grew up with. I know it's changed and I understand why, but there still needs to be some part of that where, you know, we're friends. We're not friends out here. Mm -hmm. You know, I say to my guys, it's okay to be nice off the ice guys. Right. You know, be good people. I think it's the focus of but, skill. Yeah. It's focus of skill. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and all the social that goes with that and wanting to make the nicest move and do this and do this and copy right. somebody. I, and I believe all that's, there's some value to that, but it has, it has changed the mentality of the game where there's less, really hard nights in the national hockey game. Totally. The I, games are boring. I don't even watch hockey anymore, to be honest. And that's not like... Yeah, I would never say that because it's given me everything I have in my life. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, there's some games I'm like, gosh, I just wish there was a little more... You know, there's, little, there's no physical contact. There's no... Great, like, people used to tune in. I mean, I didn't to like... I want to I wanna watch somebody... Like, I want them to, to compete. Yeah. Rather than like, you're not just competing for the scoreboard. You're competing for like masculinity. I think that the idea, of, I, I talk about this a lot, was like the idea of a worthy adversary. Yeah. Like as a man, I'm sure you, you feel the same. Like I want someone to compete against me. I want you to bring your best so that I can know where I am, what I have to get better. Yeah. And they do that from the skill perspective. But there's also the physical component. I get why they don't because everyone's contract is so big and like someone gets hurt, you know, it breaks a hand. Yeah, and then the, I mean, the, the 80 game season and the travel, I mean, all that, yes. you know, all that, we, I, I get all that. Like, you know, I, I do, I, I don't stray too far from my beliefs that recovery is a thing. Everything, yeah. You know, so if you're not recovering, you don't, you don't do what you did the day before. Right. You know, I was a young, at an older age than my late thirties, the game's over. I'm like, okay, what am I doing now to feel this good tomorrow? You know, and that's nutrition, that's uh, cold therapy, yeah. that's maybe a quick 12 minute spin. Yeah, that's how I played the rest of my career. After losing my career at thirty, getting it back through lifestyle change, nutrition, training, then I was like, okay, I need to play as long as I can. I had a really good dear friend of mine that that died in a plane crash, Brad Rickerman, uh, in Russia when he yeah. went to coach over there, and he used to say to me, he used to say, Roy, and my middle aged Roy, Roy, 
make them cut the skates off you. You know, play yeah. as long as you can. Yeah. And he was coaching at the time. Like he says, you'll never have more fun than while you're playing the game. And and I and I truly believe that. I, I miss the game every day. And I do. I miss playing the game. I miss competing. But still why I go out and play with my buddies a couple times a week. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a great non impact game when you're not making contact. Right. It's easy on your body. Truly. So I, I truly believe that that uh um, the game is an amazing game. I would never put the game down. Yes, it's changed, but there are elements of the game I still wish, I still think need to be in the game to keep the fans engaged. I think it, it's going to be a massaging forever. It'll be, yeah. it, it'll always continue to evolve. Agreed. Yeah. So let's talk about what we just spoke about there. You had 10 years before, a little over 10 years before you said, you know, your career ended for the first time. Yeah. And so I'd love to hear what that story was. Yeah. Like, uh, I would say it's an emotional story for me. I went through a time where, you know, I got hit from behind in the early 90s in Toronto. They took me off of a stretcher. I battled it for about three years where I had nerve, se severe nerve damage. Um, I had what they call for amyl stenosis. I basically got to the point in the 1994 playoffs where I couldn't cut my food. And I was playing against Vancouver. I was wearing a horse collar. I was getting hit from behind. I spent most of my time obviously in the corner and around the net. Uh, I remember, you know, barely being able to tie my skates out, barely being able to, you know, I had to put, my right arm was really wide and grab my right arm and I would put on the knob of my stick and I'd go out on the ice. So I went through a time uh, that was not a lot of fun. Uh, we lost in triple, over, I don't know triple overtime, we lost in overtime, Pavel Burry scored in 94 playoffs. And I would say it's the only time in my career where I truly sat on the bench and if you look at the highlights, you'd still see me sitting there going like, it was the first time I ever was happy, I didn't have to put my equipment on the next day because I couldn't defend myself. I was out there playing and uh, and not having a lot of fun back then, and no one's fault. But you know, the message to me through the medical staff was, "We've got severe nerve damage. You'll heal over the summer." Right? Uh, little did I know that it would be almost two years before my nerves, two surgeries in two years before my nerves would regenerate enough for me to build any muscle back to protect myself and allow me to go back to play. So it was. Uh, it was, you know, the part of the part of the journey. I would say I'm stronger mentally today because of what I went what I went through. And I retired from the game, and uh, you know, I took a really bad hit after my surgeries. I came back and played. Ended up winning the Bill Masterton that 1996 in in June as comeback player of the year. But what, what got squashed in the game late in the season was Chicago, and uh, lost between my arms for almost five minutes. Sat in the bench, and I said after I'm behind. No, just like kind of got one guy hit me this way, one guy hit me this way, and got a really bad, and you know, like football burner. Yeah, but it wouldn't go away. And like I said, when I had my surgeries, I'll do the rehab, I'll come back to play. If it happens again, I'm probably going to retire. And uh, when it happened, I thought, shh, it's over. So I stopped playing, and like April didn't play in the playoffs that year. Uh, announced my retirement at the Bill Ma at the, the NHL Awards, where I was uh, given the Bill Masterton. And then I thought, okay, I'll just get on and do other things. Uh, Wayne McMee was the next player that had retired. He was involved in uh, a golf course in Calgary. He did a, a corporate uh, corporate logoing uh, business. I uh, was doing some stuff in NHLPA, was doing some stuff for some companies in Calgary. I jumped on and started working with him. And uh, September went. I uh, wouldn't go to the rink to watch. October went. I was still working with Wayne. We were playing squash in the afternoon, a few beers, you know, retired. But I'm 30 years old, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a little money in the bank. Uh, one daughter at home and thought, uh, gosh, the phone was ringing. I was like, what am I going to do with my life? Like working in this industry, you know? So I walked in one day and I remember saying to Wayne McBean, I said, Beaner, I love you, buddy. But I said, I can't do this. I got to find a way to go back to play. And, uh, and truly around that time, it was uh, November. So I'd already watched two months of hockey after I retired in 1996. And I remember uh, Lauren Goldenberg, a uh, long time friend, still talk to Lauren today. So very loyal to what he what he's done for me. He called me and said, hey, just talk to Mark Lindsay, Dr. Lindsay. He said, you think she should uh, go see Dr. Michael A. out in Colorado Springs? And uh, I said, oh, Goldie, I said, I've done you know, I'm done just about everything that I think I can do to come back and play. And he's like, he said, well, would you think about it? So I thought about it for four or five days, and I told my wife at the time that I was going to go see this doctor in Colorado Springs. 
And then truly that's when I went up there. He did ART on me for five days. I cried in a chair. He had me strapped down on a bed. He was into my subscat, my neck, and my whole upper body was just so at ease from the beating I'd taken you know, playing pro hockey and, and not the ability to build any muscle to support it. So I was, I was pretty beat up. Like I was, I was in tough shape and uh, spent five or six days there, started to really feel better. And then he said to me, son, he said, Charles Polkin lives in, uh, in Calgary. You should get hooked up on him. He trains Olympic athletes. Um, I think he, all, his, all his athletes are competing in the winter, so he might have time for you. So that's when I called Lauren and said, hey, do you know this Charles Polkin guy? He said, like, oh my gosh, I went to school with Charles. He said, mm -hmm. uh, he said, truly, he said, I got into the NHL. Like I was a strength coach in the NHL. He said, Charles kept learning. Like he's the smartest guy I know. And uh, so I called Charles. And that's truly where my comeback, I went to see Charles. And uh, Charles was as honest as the days long and told, told me a proof I didn't want to hear at the time. Uh, looked at me, evaluated me. You had a special way of saying it. A very special way of saying it. <laughs> he looked at me and said, uh, I've seen bigger arms on a chair. Right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, I got that. And then we kind of, you know, he did some work on me and evaluated me. Uh, I told him what my goal was. My goal was just to get healthy. That was my goal because I, I literally couldn't play two games of golf in a row. I couldn't turn my neck. I had no strength. I had atrophy everywhere. And uh, and then we negotiated a price. And, then, and basically, I was going to pay him a certain fee uh, for every hour he spent with me. And then I was going to pay them the second half of the fee if I made it back from the NHL. Mm -hmm. And I spent every day with that guy for 10 months. And uh, he taught me everything at that time that I knew about nutrition and about training, about supplementation. It was amazing. It was an amazing ride, that part. And that's when I come back in 1997. And uh, gosh, went on to play to 2009. So I was, you know, I was a, it's a long story. Boring with any more of it, but, but Charles Bullock and Lauren Goldenberg, uh, those were the guys that really got me back on. Uh, Dr. Mark Lindsay, my call Dr. Michael A. at the time. Everybody was afraid of chiropractors, but I really felt, for me, Chiropractor saved my career. And so uh, there's a whole bunch we skipped over right there that I think is just gold for people listening. So people listening want to understand performance and they want to understand like, how do I take a body that isn't working the way I want it to and take it to where I want to go? So when you walk into a talk with a guy like Charles, what does that, what does that look like? What, like, what is the conversation? Uh, where'd you guys start? What do you remember? What stands out to your mind as being, you know, was it hard? Was it specific? Was it, was it different every day? Like what stands out in your mind as being, what else is instrumental? The, the biggest reason I wasn't playing, I just wasn't strong enough to play. And at that time, he was recognized as the number one strength coach in the National Hockey League. Yep. Not National Hockey League, I take that back. I was his first NHL player, but in sport. Yep. He was to be bobsledders. You know, I saw, I went and watched the bobsledders. Part of this introduction to him was watching the bobsledders train. You know, watching the guy like Dave McKechnie and Jack Pick, like all these uh, yep. bobsledders that I knew back in Calgary. Mm -hmm. who are machines. They were big, strong, powerful. And I'm like, that's what I need to look like. Yep. That's how I need to train. Charles was no doubt. He taught me, like I never knew, like Lauren Gold, don't get me right, I wouldn't want to put Lauren down because Lauren was amazing. But I did a lot of uh, lipid lifting with Lauren. Like I was uh, more doing that kind of stuff. Uh, back then I used to fight with Lauren in my 20s. Well, like my legs are huge. I don't need to train my legs. I just need to do pull-ups because that was really a test I really sucked at, right? Because right? hockey players that have heavy legs, pull-ups are really hard for them. Yeah. So I really wanted to work on my upper body and work on pull-ups. So I didn't really, you know, probably listen to Laura as much as I should have. But when I looked at what Charles Polkin did to me, when it came to, you know, eccentric loading, when it came to tempo, I mean, doing 60-second pull-ups, doing, you know, uh, neck bridges to try to stimulate the neurons so I was stronger the next set. Like, stuff he did, at, I was 30 years old. And we're talking 27 years ago. Yep. Uh, it was pretty extreme, you know, how to eat, when to eat what he, and it was just like, no, we can't do that. No, we can't do that. And then I took him to Arizona. I remember taking Charles to golf to Arizona. I said, because everybody in Calgary started to see me training at Lindsay Park every day. Like, oh, Robertson making a comeback. And they come back. And I didn't want any part of it. I didn't know whether I was ever going to make a comeback. And it wasn't until end of February, I trained with Charles, just a member. And I was doing a pull-up one day. I had like 55 pounds between my legs. And uh, I got down to the pull-up bar and he looked at me. He said, uh, you're going to play again. And it was like, took like three months of training with him every day and some days, twice a day for him to say that to me. And I still remember that day. Like I had, I had chills. 
you know, I had chills. I was like, holy shit, I, I'm, I'm healthy. And, uh, but that was no drinking. That was 100% nutrition based. You know, I mean, I, not that I take carb powders anymore, but I remember taking 200 grams of Cytomax after every word mm -hmm. out. Like, you know, like I was, to, I was totally into it. Uh, so I, I owe a lot. I, I, like I said, very, very uh, passionately. Like I'm in the industry because of what those guys did for me. You know, the Lauren Goldenberg to Charles Pollock and uh, a good friend of mine, Sam Bach, who's, uh, who's a brilliant guy who helped me in my 20s. Like all these guys introduced me to the nutrition, to the training. Matt Nichol uh, was with me as a Leaf. I had Andy O'Brien, spent some time with Andy in Florida. Like I've been really fortunate to be around some amazing uh, experts in the field of strength and conditioning and wellness. And, uh, and I believe that uh, in the National Hockey League, it's uh, still underappreciated for what those guys do behind the scenes for all the players. It's definitely shifting, as we spoke about just before recording. Like guys like yourself and, and Andy are, and Lauren are doing a great job to lead the charge in a way that's uh, objective. I think the problem in the past was it's like it wasn't it wasn't measurable. Like if right. that team wins, why did they win? Now we can definitively say this: these, you know, there's less injuries. There's there's more. Uh, you know, progress is more yeah. speed. There's, you know, less injury games would be a big metric in the NHL, as you know. So you guys can measure that. Whereas in the past, it was like, I think they're a good coach, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I think, uh, you know, all the, all the, all those methods, uh, whether it's, whether it's catapult, whether it's polar, whether it's you know, all these uh, measurables and now we can measure players' uh, work capacity and, and, and really players that are willing to look at the numbers and try to understand what helps them play in certain zones and what's helped, what helps them recover. Yeah. You know, it takes a real, it takes a strength coach. Obviously it's a big job. Teams do spend more money in that area. Uh, but players that are willing to listen, there's a lot more information out there that they can use in order to give them, themselves the best opportunity. There's some trust involved there. You know, there's always contrast. There's always, you know, stuff behind the scenes in the game that you gotta, you gotta really watch out for who you hire and watch it, make sure that they're there for the, you know, I would say, guys, it's not, it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's about our client. It's about the players. You know, uh, I had a team behind the team that helped me. I want to be the nice, quiet team behind the team, team that helps the best players in the world. Yeah. I'm not looking for a pat on the back. I'm not looking to be on the front page of any magazine. Uh, I'm, I'm not a good salesman. I always say I'm not a good salesman. I love what I do, um, but I like to do it quietly, and I like to help players quietly. But the players that listen, uh, it's no secret. I'm, you know, I'm not the best salesman in the world, but... We've been doing this since 2009, the year I retired. And uh, the, the players, obviously, I didn't give a lot of those players their skill level, but but they've taken the information we've given them. And I've had the same team of professionals, uh, Adrian, Lucas, Sylvie, Brian, for a decade. So, you know, I, I the only players, the only strength coaches that I've lost in my company have gone to the National Hockey League. It's about treating people well. It's about making people, give people their identity within the within the, the brand and the company and let them run with it. And uh, and I've been fortunate to have an amazing team to help build this and continue to to share. I mean, I have nothing to hide. When I say to everybody, You're, my door's open every day. You want to walk in my door? You want to see what we do? Come see what we do. Because mm -hmm. I really truly believe it's not, a, it's not an exercise. It's not one exercise in the gym. That's, you know, it, it's it's the system and it's, it's the... It's the education of the players seeing the best players in the world. What do they do? What do they do every day? Right. It sounds like um, do a degree of understanding who's in front of you and then meeting them where, where they are with what they need. There's a degree of care and empathy, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Care and empathy. And I mean, not every story is as in a guy playing with. Right. Like I, I feel very badly for, for players. I, uh, you know, I'm, I get emotional when I try to, you know, I try to help a guy hang on playing the National Hockey League. You know, the moments that guys get big contracts, that's obviously fulfilling for the, for all of us. The guys that put the work in, they got rewarded. But the guys that are struggling every year, that come to us every year and, you know, they've reached their true potential as a player, but now they're trying to hang on. Seeing a player could make a comeback for me, like Peter Holland this year came to me, you know, met with me in May, said, hey, oh, I'm really struggling. I want to come back to play. I don't like what I'm doing. Brought him in, he'll help them out a little bit financially to get to the point to, to do it. The half you say for me this this year, this fall, was when Peter Holland called me and said, Hey, Rob's, I got, a, got an American League contract. 
come back playing pro hockey. And he's 33 years old. I hadn't played in the National Hockey League for, I think, four years, five years. I spent a little time in Europe and then retired. So those moments of helping players that aren't the best players in the world right. are just as gratifying to my whole company than, than the ones that are that are very, very successful, right? So everybody matters, and I think that's the, the, uh, the uh, professionalism I've tried to instill every day at our facility. Doesn't matter if you're 12, doesn't matter if you're 40, you matter. And, and we're gonna give you the same information, the same care, and, and try to get you to, to live a routine. I believe it's a routine of, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of lifestyle, your routine, your lifestyle, all those, all those uh, elements that eventually define you as an athlete or a player. It's repetition, repetition, mm -hmm. repetition. Like consistency. Just, yeah. Consistency. It's like every day. How much water did you have? You know, like the conversations. I say my strength coach, you're not just strength coach. It's like, what did, what did you eat before you came in here today? Mm -hmm. You know, are we, do we have something to build with? You're a leader. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it's not just, it's, it's, you know, maybe not totally comfortable talking nutrition with your athlete, but you need to be. There, I always, I always like to say to kids come to, come to the gym, they don't have any kill. And I'm like, hey, go upstairs, get some food, hang out for half hour, come back down and start your workout. You know, I'm a big, big advocate of being fueled to play. And that's why, you know, FDR, you know, our, we say it's like fuel, train, recover. And it's that cycle, day in and day out, right? If you're not fueled, then not, if nothing else matters. Correct, yeah. And that's, you know, one of my true beliefs. Yeah, so talk to me about the training, Gary. So what was it about the training that uh, stood out to you, either when you were doing it or now, about your approach? And, and I'm curious, you know, some people love training. Some people hate it. Some people think it's a job. And some people like certain things and hate other things. I'm curious how you personally approach the training from a mindset perspective. Yeah, I, I think the the challenges of what I went through. You know, I, I I'll be honest. I was in my twenties, doing what everybody else did. You know, having beers and wings and and working hard. I mean, I made the national hockey. League. I was playing the national hockey. League, so obviously, I did some part. Yeah, I was a hardworking guy, but I didn't follow the rest of the stuff. Hence, why I, my body started to break down at twenty seven. Seven years of pro hockey, fighting, getting hit from behind, not really having the muscle in my upper body to defend myself. Uh, for me, those those were the the um, the habits that I had to I had to change. Go back to your question: How was your, your uh, mindset toward training? Fitness became a bigger part of the game, and I was a big advocate of you know first impressions were lasting impressions. So going to training camp, uh, passing the fitness tests became my passion. Preparation became my passion. You know, standing on the line and uh, knowing that I had prepared for the test, I was excited to write it. You know, standing on the blue line nights early in my career when you maybe had too much fun the night before, didn't do all the things that you should have done to be ready to play, created anxiety for me and had a lot of it. And, um, you know, I had a couple of nights that you can play guilty early on in the late 80s and 90s. But eventually, you can't play guilty very often. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I really enjoyed beginning to enjoy. I wanted to win the fitness test at training camp. And I know now I say to people, yes, did I do things wrong? Yeah, did I did I lift too heavy at times? Did I did I um, did I overtrain for sure? You know, I was I was a guy that overtrained. And, uh, you know, then in my career, I learned a lot more about, uh, recovery and modalities to help me recover. But, but I definitely, I definitely fell in love with, uh, preparing to, to, uh, to write the test and being that guy training cat where everybody's like, holy shit, that guy's in shape. You find that transfer to the ice? 100%. Yeah. And the confidence, the confidence I had and the, the fitness level that I had in my thirties to, you, we all get to a certain level of um the uh, skill i knew that i wasn't the most skilled guy in the world i knew that i brought something to a line that was going to benefit my line mates i wanted to play with good players so how it was i that maybe i didn't consider myself a skilled guy how was i going to play with the best players on the team so what did you bring to that line just uh, intangibles the intensity uh physicalness being a good teammate being first on the puck creating those opportunities. Um, I look at some of the Hall of Famers, centermen that I played with, 
my job was to get them to puck and protect them. And I was, I was, you know, not too my own horn, but I was, I was pretty good at that job. You're very good. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good job. So I, I found a niche that not everybody wanted to do and, uh, and made a career at it. Which player that you played with impacted you most or inspired you most? Anyone come to mind? Oh gosh, a long list of, uh, think about the, the, having the opportunity to play with better players, you know, obviously my long time childhood from uh, buddy, Joe Newendike and I grew up together, hmm. played into squirt hockey against each other. And I know people have heard that story over and in, but you know, I was on the rent and he was on the owls, you know, we we're named after birds. Uh, we were, we were five years old playing wow. home and, uh, became really good buddies, uh, ended up playing lacrosse together, hockey together. Uh, we went different routes. I got drafted at the Ontario Hockey League. He ended up going to Cornell University. And I was drafted in 84 in the first round of Calgary. He was drafted in 85 in the second round of Calgary. Oh, wow. So we ended up playing uh, 10 years on the same line, basically, mm -hmm. in Calgary. And then uh, went our separate ways. But uh, he was a player that, you know, when he went to the National Hockey League, won Rookie of the Year in the National Hockey League. And I had an opportunity to play with him, and I remember being, a, I was fighting my way through, trying to scrap here, get the on goal, but the most part, I was fighting my way into the National Hockey League, and he looked at me with Danny Sarubs, you're a better player than that, you don't need to, you don't need to fight anymore. And I still fought, but I ended up getting a couple goals that night. I remember saying to him after the game, I said, you yeah, know, shit, dude, that was a lot more fun than fighting, you know? So I started, you know, I had scored in junior, but it took me a while to become a scorer in the National Hockey League. I had a little tougher journey that way, uh, finding my way. But a guy like uh, Joe Newman Dyke, uh, Lanny McDonald, like I spoke about earlier, was one of the greatest captains and mentors you could ever have as a young player. Uh, taught us how to act, not just on the ice, but off the ice. How did he do that? Just the way he carried himself. He was, uh, you know, you play with the guys that are yellers and screamers. They yell and scream every night, right? And you're like, and you're like can, you get tired of it over time. Uh, when Lanny McDonald spoke in the dressing room, there was like, as soon as he started to speak, everybody stopped. He might have been doing your shin pads. He might have been tying your skates. But he just had this way about him that you knew it was important if Lanny McDonald was talking. And um, we'd be sitting on the bus after games. And not that autograph uh, seekers were that big at the time, but he would stand outside that bus and he would sign everybody's card. So just though his his mannerisms, his his approach to the game, his friendliness, he's is a genuine I mean, heads wise, you know, president and chairman of the Hockey Hall of Fame and uh spoke on the ice two days ago. He's just he's just an amazing human being and taught us so much about uh being a good pro being a good pro. Um <clears throat> one of the things he said to me, remember I said, Holy crap, we used to call him Lars and said Lars says you spent a lot of time with their sign autographs. And he said, well, we're obviously to remember all those people you pass on the way up are the same people you're going to pass on the way down. Hmm. I think that was something his dad used to tell him. And it kind of registered with me and like, you know, so I, I've kind of taken that uh, to, you know, yes, I know it's changed as people make money off your autograph. Um, but very, I mean, I try to stop and sign as many as I can. I recognize someone who has 10 pictures, all of the same photo. I'll sign a couple and say, hey, is that good? You know, uh, but I, I'll never turn down an autograph. And a lot of that comes from what I learned from a guy like Ian McDonald. Uh, I spoke about Brad McCrimmon, another guy that taught me how to work. The same my dad taught me how to work. But I used to train with Brad McCrimmon in the summer before he passed away. And that man taught me how to work. He was a farmer from Plenty, Saskatchewan. He'd take me to his farm, make me work on the on the bin skirts. And he uh, used to call me a spoiled city boy, which it wasn't really. But <laughs> but I hadn't done a lot of... It's rub you a little bit. I hadn't done a lot of grunt labor, right? He used to always laugh at me, but he would put his Harvey Munder on, his silky little small shorts, and we would run the gravel roads in Plenty of Saskatchewan, and I would chase this guy around. And he was, he had fun, but he was a hardest working uh, guy that I'd come across in that, that time of my career. So there's, you know, there's moments, those kind of players, and obviously you get to play with good centermen, like Ronnie Francis was an amazing player, Matt Sundin, an amazing player, Newendike. Um, that I had later in my career, I mean, I think about those guys I played with, I mean, my finish my career playing with, you know, Sidney Crosby and Steven Samkos. Mm -hmm. So that's the range of players I played with. Those guys taught me how to how to play and gave me the confidence that I could be more than just a fighter. Uh, the Francis's, the New and Dykes, those guys. And then uh, the St Stamkos's and Crosby's made me realize how much the game was changing. You know, seeing the speed of the game, seeing the dedication off the ice, seeing the 
extra stuff they did on the ice. You know, it wasn't just practice, how much skill development they did and how much time, how much the game was changing by players spending way more time on the ice to be better hockey players. So went from fitness on the ice to now skill on the ice. Correct. Yeah. And then less, and look, not not just less time in the gym, but but that's what it, you know, individualization, I think, is gone back into the gym because you need to almost train the player for the position they play and totally. the type of player they are, yeah. rather than just be big and strong. Everybody's got to be big and strong. I mean, that to a certain level. To a certain level. Yeah, and then after that, it's it's like mm. individualization. And I think that's the challenge for our strength coaches, and Adrian would say it, Lucas Bryan, is is dealing with the amount of volume the players to try to accomplish in the sum. Yeah. If you're a younger athlete, I'm like, what's keeping you away from playing in the National League? If it's your strength, then you better give yourself a chance to get strong. Yeah. You can't skate five days a week away from here and in fact to get strong. Right. And and it's that I think that's the biggest frustration for all of us, and not the frustrating, but biggest challenge is to try to get the parents to understand you want your player to play in junior hockey league in two years or play in national league in four. Uh, I was trying to think it straight in conditioning has to be the biggest uh, factor for the next twelve weeks. Yeah, not his, not his power skating, not his stick handling. Uh, he needs to get more fit. So he needs to get stronger. And you got to get the buy-in from people to sell that and get them and get them convinced that that has to be done or the rest of it doesn't really matter. So you mentioned two names, Lana McDowell, Brad McCrimmon. I'm curious if, do leaders like that still exist in the NHL? It'd be not fair for me to say, but I'd say no. Harder. Like I said, those leaders need to really have an impact on the game. I look at a guy who I just played with on the weekend, had a few shifts with him, uh, Patrick Marlowe. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, meet a nicer, nicer man. I think he had a big influence on the, the late, the elite young players. Really seemed like they respected him, and he was a bit of a father figure to them. Uh, seems like a real gem. So I, 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 I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I would say there's less of them. Um, but I look at him as being a guy who was recently retired that I think had, still had a pretty big impact. He had a pretty big impact on the game still because he was still a fairly you know, good player. Yeah. But it was also an amazing human. So players were, and the other players were attracted to them. But I do believe it's a bigger challenge because, I, like I said, I think that player uh, needs to still have a pretty impact on the team to uh, uh, to get that respect. How many hours, hours a day are you training during your career? You know, obviously, days you're, you're, you're playing, you're not, you're maybe doing a little bit, but not the same amount that you may do on the off days or in the off season. What does that look like? You know, an hour a day, two hours a day, five hours a day, an hour of skill. Do you have like an like a overall idea what that would look like? Yeah, for me personally, no. or yeah, like I know when I went to Charles, um, and he changed my feeling around training. Uh, I was never allowed to train two energy systems within a four hour period, so I would do I would do my strength in the morning and get up, I'd eat, do a little stretching. He wasn't big on stretching, but a little stretching, and uh, a little bit of a dynamic, and I get into my lift. And then I would do my energy system. So I was on like a five day cycle, right? So I would, I would have uh, four workouts in two days, and then the next day's completely off. And then that next day, I had to overeat those days, and then I would, and then I'd have a uh, the next day I would train again, and do two workouts, and then I had another day off. So two complete days off every five day cycle. Mm-hmm. But I would do six workouts in those in, in those five days, and I couldn't believe how I grew. Like, he convinced me, you know, I want you to eat more on your day off, not less. Right. And everybody said, well, I did work out today, so I cut my protein. Or I cut my it's a recovery day. It's recovery day. Yeah, so how to recover. Well, we, the nutrition. That's why I said, well, can I play golf today? He said, no, it's your recovery day. So I want you to eat. Right. Sit down. Sit down, relax, eat, and then we'll get back out of tool. So so I always did my energy, whether I was going to run hills, do stairs, do a bike, whatever I was going to do energy system wise happened at dinner. What I loved about that was it kept me the afternoons. I wasn't golfing. Mm. I wasn't on my dock at Min Muskoka having a beer. You know, I was like, no, I got to work out tonight. And it really, and on my days off, I, I knew I had to focus. So the really, it really simplified my training. But when I trained, I believe when I train hard, I, tr- I worked, I trained hard. But when I rest, I need to rest hard too. You know what I mean? Like, of course. Yeah. And that's where I think it's a bigger challenge for players too, because everyone, everybody feels the need to be so busy. I have a tough time telling guys, okay, you can't golf 
after every weight training workout, right? And people don't understand what it does to your nervous system. Golf, correct? Yep. I, I, I played in my late in my thirties. I was, you know, I ended up going to Florida. I thought, oh, you know, I'll play a little golf my days off, and I played two rounds of golf in Florida the whole winter. And the next day after golf, I was flat as a pancake. I had I had, I was dehydrated. I just had no jump in my step. And the sitting out in eighty degree golf weather, whether I had a beer or not, walking twenty thousand steps, walking, <laughs> even if I took a cart, you yeah. know, off here under the heat, you're yeah. drinking water, but you're you're still not you're not recovering. Right. And so uh, so golf is harder on your system. So any players, that's part of the you know that's the challenge. That's the journey is, is saying guys. How committed are you and, and how long do you want to play? And really, how you live your summers. Your summers are your time. Because in season, if you're a hockey player that's playing, you know, 16 to 22 minutes a night, you're not getting stronger in season. Right. You're holding this together. You're holding it together. Yeah. You're, you're, you're doing some maintenance work. You're doing, I would say, go into the gym every day. Spend 20 minutes on your body every day. You need to do body maintenance. If you don't do, don't do body maintenance, whatever that looks like for you individually, you don't do it, you don't make it for the season. And in January and February, when you want to play your best, like I say, we train all year for playoffs, right? That's why we work out. That's why I'm such a, like, like, like I, I couldn't have a stronger belief about strength training during the season. If you're not going to strength train for nine months, nine months of the year, right. you're going to just strength train for three months. You're going to fall apart. What, you're going to fall apart. Yep. And the key to the teams that have success is, is convincing their players that off-ice training is mandatory in season. There's a way to do it, and certain guys need more, certain guys need less. But it's definitely not one workout on the board that's prescribed to all. You know, there needs to be, an, uh, and I think that's where strength coach and national they have gotten a lot better. There needs to be some level of individualization for in-season training, to, for performance, for recovery, and for longevity. How are you assessing and measuring guys in the NHL to determine how to do it? And that could be in season or off season. Yeah, I think um, you know. In, in, I mean, obviously, you have your, you know, we'll do some, we'll do jumps, force plates, right? We'll do, uh, we'll do some type of, uh, some type of uh, amyl, amyl, uh, sorry, aerobic capacity work, whether it's like a three minute bike ride. You know, we have like little five question questionnaire that guys fill out every day. Um, you know, it's mandatory, I think, in the cities that I've um, worked for. To be in front of your strength coach face to face every day, walk in, have that conversation. How you feeling today? How'd you sleep last night? How much water did you drink? What did you do yesterday in your day off? All those little conversations that give the strength coach an idea of your readiness to train, your readiness to uh, to play that day, and then and then having the the ear of the of the coaches and stuff to to be able to go in as a strength coach and say, hey, you know what, our guys, we got half a dozen guys who are pretty behind up, you know, or, or pretty fatigued. We need him. How about giving him an easy day? You know, but if you, if you're, if you, if you have a few numbers, and not that you need to, like, you cannot inundate players each and every day. Oh, we're going to do this test today. We're going right. to do this test today. You know, there's a, there's a, a watt bike test. We do like a six second watt bike test that players, you can, you can incorporate into their, into their strength training. You know, can, can, there's just certain ways to do it that, that the players aren't always feel like they're being evaluated. And some players are way more willing to look at the numbers because they know that they have the, the strength coach has the best interest on the player. So gaining that trust is first and foremost for the strength coach. He needs to gain the trust of the player. This is for you. This is going nowhere else than you. But eventually, as a strength coach, if you have a player that just doesn't buy and edit, edit it, that you know, doesn't wear his heart rate monitor or does not prepare to wear the catapult in practice or not not prepared to get any numbers on them, then eventually the, the strength coach is in no position to say, sorry, coach, I got no information on this guy. It's okay if you're playing great. But the moment you don't play well right. are the moment that those measurables become important. So, you know, so it's a, it's, it's, it, it, it is a challenge, but there's a, there's a way to do it. I would, I say Nate Brooks is one of the best I've, I've seen in the National Hockey League in Seattle. A uh, wonderful guy in it for the right reasons, does, does everything he can every day for the players to give the players the ability to, to play their best. Uh, Jake Jensen's the, our assistant in Seattle. And have a really a lot of respect for the way they operate and how caring they are for the players. So I know the players are in good hands there, and it's a it's a good feeling when uh, you know you watch uh, Seattle what they've accomplished in a very short period of time. Uh, I know a lot of that has to do with what those players are doing off the ice. 
I know an enormous part of what you teach is recovery. I want to talk about nutrition because obviously nutrition is this very vast landscape and everyone's got their own unique approach. And some people, you know, it's paleo and it's like, you know, it's got to be keto. And um, so I, I've heard even within the NHL, I talked to a lot of guys and there's a big spectrum. Yeah. So I'm curious what your approach, what approach you have seen most effective for your athletes. Yeah. And, I, and you know, we would say we're always conscious of the fact that it's expensive, right? Like you need to understand that parents invest so much money in their kids, the equipment, you know, the on ice training, the off ice training, the food, like, like it really, it can be overwhelming for families. So when parents call me and say, Hey, should my son take creatine or should my son take glutamine? And I'll say, Hey, like, how's your family's nutrition? Like, how do you guys eat? Try to get an idea Like, what the message I'm trying to get across is food will always be first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the simplicity of it is, and I know we could go down that rabbit hole for a while and everybody has their belief, you know, but whole real foods don't lie. In my opinion, when I take players grocery shopping, I say, look at the ingredients, you know, what's in this. If you don't understand 10 of the ingredients that are in what you're about to buy, whether it's a protein bar or whether it's some kind of snack, whether I'm like, don't buy it, you know, if it says oats, oats are pretty good. If it says almonds, it's pretty good. And we can get into the depth of nutrition through, mm -hmm. you know, I have strength coaches that are like this, like, okay, I don't, I don't have any oxalates. I don't, you know, I don't have any dairy. I'm, I'm completely vegan or whatever their belief says. I just think for the game of hockey and for that, we talked about how young the game is today. Where are those players going to get their food if they get so extreme that they actually don't, the worst thing, and Charles Bolton always said to me, I don't care. This is how you got to eat, but never not eat. You always have to eat. And he was like, I don't care where you are. Make the best choice in a bad situation. As a parent and as a young athlete, that's what I prescribe. It starts with whole real foods. And as they get older, yes, you can introduce some supplementation. I believe that, you know, players that are playing National Hockey League, the energy they burn, the travel, the sleep, obviously they need supplementation. There's certain things we prescribe, but it still goes back to our basis and our true belief is that if you're covering, you know, the rainbow and you're covering, you know, fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, you know, some starchy carbohydrates that have fiber. I mean, I was through a stage in my career with Charles, I was not allowed to eat anything white, nothing. You know, that was his. So I mean like no chicken? No, 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 no rice, no potato, no bread, uh, just fruit vegetables and meat and that's and that's what I ate with Charles and uh, I mean it worked for me I mean you know I've done some uh, DNA genetic testing I know that you know for me my body works well on meat you know so so I've always been a protein guy I would say probably ate too much protein at some point in my career I've kind of toned that down obviously as I've gotten older I don't eat as much saturated fat uh, but no doubt that the fiber I needed the fiber I wasn't getting out of fiber eating 300 plus grams of protein a day I was you know my heaviest in the national hockey I was 215 you know thinking hey, I a hockey player yeah I was down 15 as a leaf and uh but I had you know a lot of strength training a lot of power uh stopped doing so much aerobic conditioning like my, my belief uh, when you talk about fitness I had to have a 60 VO2 to play in the National Hockey League. That's what we were all told in the 90s, right? You don't have a 60 VO2, you can't play. So running and biking became very important if you wanted to have a 60 VO2. The heavier you were, the harder it, was. Becomes, yeah. harder it becomes, right? So I was 188 pounds with a 64 VO2. Um, but I, you know, I couldn't bench press 135 pounds. Hmm. You know, so there, there's, there's a fine line. Now I would say I, in my 30s, I became more of a power athlete. And my BO2 drop, no doubt about it. I can show it to tell you the results. But I was also 215 instead of 188. And uh, But I was stronger, faster, healthier. Because I muscle held you together, weren't injured as much? Of course. I, I wasn't injured as much. And yes, I had some muscle tears because I got too lean sometimes. You know, some of my, some of my, I had an oblique tear, I had a groin tear. You know, on a, on a, on a DEXA scan, I was like 8.5 body fat. And it was probably too lean back then, right? The caliper show was probably, you know, it was probably a, probably a four, probably a five. You know, I don't, I don't prescribe players to be ultra lean. I believe you play 20 minutes a night, you need some fat on your body. And then it's like, oh, okay, you're too lean. Like you need fat and you up. So there's a, 
And I think that's what, you know, I, uh, when I, when I get players for, think about it, I'm with a player for almost 80 days in the summer and I've done some stuff on the side. I, I've worked for, I've worked for uh, Vegas and I've worked for Pittsburgh, worked for Seattle with prospect development, but I truly don't think those players understand the, some of them, the, the real message of consistency until I get a player for 80 days and I'm in his space every day, you know, then and wait to eat. How'd you sleep? What'd you do last weekend? You can't have another weekend like last weekend. All these, all these touch points, trying to get the player to develop a routine and lifestyle for longevity. And, uh, you know, that's kind of go somewhere else with it. But. Yeah, let's talk about recovery, man. I know that, that's a, that was a special place in your heart. You yeah. talk about that a lot and how that was ultimately able to sustain your career as long as it did. And now you've got some incredibly unique, uh, as we look around here in your, your beautiful gym, you've got some incredibly unique modalities. So I'd be curious what you did during your career that was yeah. hugely impactful. Yeah. And then maybe what you do now that's the most impactful. Yeah, I mean, I would say the biggest thing I did, obviously, was nutrition. Uh, between my, at the age of 30, uh, nutrition was obviously the basis of my recovery. Uh, some supplementation, but for the most part, it was nutrition. And then on the recovery side, I, I did like to spin the bike uh, post playing. So I'd spin the bike for 12 minutes. I'd do a little stretch, and then I'd get in cold tubs. And then I was in uh, cold tubs after every game for the last decade of my career. Uh, I had you know I had roommates that joke around about you know me yelling at them, "Go get some more ice, put it in the bathtub." You know, I was big on I was big on cold tubs. Yeah, before uh, it was famous. Now it's now everyone's doing it. Now everybody's doing yeah. it. And this was you know I was having the ad like I have a friend of mine and Mike Vernon that went into the Hall of Fame and we were literally were joking two nights ago that uh, I would yell at Vernie and say, Vernie, the ice is melting. Uh, and I said, get me some more ice. And he'd go get buckets of ice and throw it in the bathtub mm -hmm. on me. And we're talking, I mean, him and I were, him and I were teammates in the early 90s. I was right. cold cuts. Uh, so I found for me that really worked for me. Of course, one night, crazy story, Brad McCurry said, hey, your back's buttoning you and go and you'll run the bath at home. So it was, I don't know, January in Calgary and I ran the bath and I'm laying in this bathtub, you know, with the Calgary cold January water up to my neck. And I'm in there and um, I'm like, I'm, how long I should lay here, you know? So like 15 minutes passes by and I feel my teeth start to chatter and I'm like, I think it's time for you to get out of here. Yeah. So I get out, I'm, I mean, buddy, we're talking like, this is like, this is 1990. And I almost killed myself Correct. in my cold tub. And I literally put on a long john sweater, uh, hoodie. Couldn't warm up. Couldn't warm up and got on my bed. And it took me hours to get my, I've my been bone. there. Like, so, so just like those are the, you know, it's a funny story. Yeah. But, but that tells you like, but I really felt that when I did a cold tub in the 90s or the 2000s, uh, the next day I had a little more jump in my legs. Completely. It worked off inflammation. Yeah. It worked for me. And it was the number one thing I did as a player. On the road, I'd, I'd ask our trainers to fill up garbage cans with ice. Really? Like we put it so we, after you jump in the all of the shower, showering, and then the ice tub would be there. You'd jump in a bucket of ice, put a mm -hmm. garbage can full of ice and water. So that's what I used to do on the road. Just stay in once and get out. Stay in one, try to stay in for as long as you can. But you know, like, no situation. You should, you know, the bus is leaving. Everybody's yelling at you. Right. You know, I was always nice. the last I did on the bus. Everybody yelled at me. Holy shit, we got to go, Rob. We're going to miss the plane. And right. I'm sitting in the cold tub. So, I mean, yeah, that guy was, I mean, for a hockey player in the, in the 90s and 2000s, that was pretty extreme. Right. I mean, guys that played, they would say I was very extreme. I had a battery-operated blender. I'd take on the plane. I'd be making protein shakes at the back of the plane. I used to always, you know, like guys would be laughing at me. They would laugh. And they'd say, like, year over the top, which I was probably. But then by the end of the year, they're like, hey, Ralph, you got any snacks? Totally. It's Arvin. I had been leave for 20 years, right? And I had yeah. my gym bag. Yeah. And my gym bag had my supplements. And it had my shaker and it had my battery-operated blender. And uh, and I used to travel everywhere with it. So supplementation, cold tubs would be the things I did for me to help me play till I was 43 years old. Eventually at 43, I retired for the second time. Um, but I really haven't left there, you know, like, yes, I have a little more fun. Yes. I cheat a little bit more, have a little more wine. Like I, I live, mm -hmm. I have four kids. Anybody that has four kids, yes, I, I get it. Right. They get it. You still got to live, but I don't stray too far from, you know, my beliefs and lifestyle nutrition really drive my performance. And, and, you know, I want to practice what I preach. I preach it every day. Mm. Uh, I have a long lineup. I'm sure of people that are hoping I get really fat one day. And, uh, and then I, 
unless it's something I can't control, right. I'm, ne I'm never getting there. It, it keeps me, it keeps me motivated. And being around the young players, and like I said earlier, having something to train for. You know, I trained for, I trained for, for beer league hockey. Not that I drink a lot of beer when I play, but that's what we call it. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to play shitty hockey. Even at 57, I want to go out and I want to, I want to play well, and I want it, and it's a workout for me. It's a day that I don't have to get on that bike over there. I could skate. Yeah, and uh, and I still love to play the game. I love to play the game. Love to compete uh, and have some fun with uh, with guys that have the same, you know, the same uh, drive or the same the same uh, you know feeling that I have. Are there a lot of guys at fifty seven who still have the same drive and and uh, <laughs> cool? I don't say fifty seven. No, I wouldn't say there's many fifty seven year olds that are that are probably set a new standard. Yeah, I would say that, but I w would say that you know generally. Uh, People are having uh, kids later in life, so I want to be I want to be pretty healthy for my grandchildren. I have a I have a 13 year old figure skater, 14 year old hockey player, 17 year old hockey player, and a 33 year old now you know yogi. I want to be healthy for as long as I can. I know life can throw some uh, some things in your direction that you can't control, um, but I certainly hope by the way I live my life and how I take care of myself, and I'm giving myself the best chance to be around here for my grandkids. Man, no doubt. Gary, absolutely a pleasure, man. Thanks. Thank you very much for making the time. Yeah, thanks, sir. Thanks for having me today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. As I promised, Gary is so just incredible with his insights. And coming from someone who's played professional sports, played at the highest level, take his information and heed his wisdom. The focus on recovery that he emphasizes time and time again is not by accident, right? Success leaves clues. He knows what he's doing. And so many of us are so stressed and we're so focused on, I want a bigger gas pedal and I want a bigger engine and I want to go harder and faster. And yeah, it's important to go hard. It's important to go fast. But if you want to go fast, you need to recover. Thanks to Gary Roberts. Thank you to his amazing family. And thank you to you for being here and supporting the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I don't take your support lightly. I do my best to get these podcasts out consistently and bring you the highest quality information and the best guests from all around the world. If you do enjoy this podcast, I would love it if you left us a review. You can do that on YouTube. You can also send me a direct message on Instagram. You can also join our Muscle Intelligence community on Facebook. We're also expanding into a new community, which I'll tell you about shortly. Um, and if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and do that right now. Spotify, YouTube, and everywhere else amazing podcasts are listened to. Ladies and gents, enjoy your day. I appreciate you. Go out and share your wisdom with the world and let's all lift each other up. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.